be telling us about people, plans, and technology, a formidable threesome in biodiversity hotspots. <laughs> Hello everybody, um, I stepped out of Africa and into the US and so I'll share about the plants that actually come from the Cape Floristic region and the work that we've been doing here today with a bunch of uh, herbalists that actually live around that area. So it has a little bit of plants, people and technology and it's various technologies from metabolomics through to biotechnology so there's a few things that I'll talk about um, during this lecture and please carry on tweeting, I'm really loving it. <laughs> Okay, so there we are, the Cape Floristic region, which happens to be a really, really special part of the world. We know that the Cape Flora um, is based there, and many species have actually radiated from there. And actually, Michelle gave a talk on Oxalis the other day, spoke a lot more about uh, symbiosis in this particular part of the world. And yesterday, we had um, Tanisha that spoke about Pelagonium, so the diversity is really quite explosive. Truly, truly amazing. Well, what about the people? Well, the people are pretty interesting themselves. Many different kinds of people actually live down there. Um, you have a very long history that's actually linked to uh, the southern tip of Africa. And this just displays a bunch of Kosa healers in an ancestral uh, ceremony. And in contrast, a Rastafarian herbalist taking a bath at the bottom of Table Mountain. Isn't that wonderful? You can actually do that. Um, and so really, it's a very varied bunch of people. So my people, the Landu, came from Central Africa and all the way down towards the Cape throughout history, and ultimately actually met up with the coin in the sand, hence the short stature that I probably have. <laughs> I've got a little bit of Bushman in me, I suppose. And at the same time, you had uh, the Dutch and various other Europeans that brought along, particularly the English, that brought along some slaves, and this resulted in a really mixed group of people. 11 official languages um, that really displays the types of people that actually live in the southern tip of Africa. And the biodiversity together with this bicultural diversity creates a very unique opportunity to explore biochemical diversity. And so that's basically what I do in my labs. So if you walk around Cape Town, you're more likely to meet the Rusters. Um, they're very, very interesting people. They've always got lots of fun stories to tell you about their trips that they take for, from Cape Town to other parts of South Africa, collecting a variety of different things, such as barks. Nina just mentioned that. Um, and then also um, different bulbs. But mainly they utilize the Cape flora, which is foliage or the fame boss or fine bush in Africa. So they basically base their knowledge on the koi and sand, and they are the main traders of plants within the region. So this group of, um, of wonderful men, Lennox and Cora, uh, were instrumental in actually forming a non-profit organization known as the Cape Bush Doctors Organization. They collected all these rusters into this non-profit, and then they have various different research projects that are actually being conducted within the Western Cape. And one of those projects is a project that I work on together with the physiologists from my um, university at Stellenbosch, and we work on breast cancer. So this Dernier is not necessarily endemic to South Africa, but it actually comes from Australia. But it has naturalized in South Africa, and it is incorporated into the ethnopharmacopoeia of the bush doctors. So they utilize it for a variety of different things. They usually use it as a strengthener in uh, mixtures. And we collected various different samples from different environments, from the Cedarberg, which is mountainous, the Hoop, which is actually coastal, and Stellenbosch, um, where they say that the plants in Stellenbosch have the best biotivity. So we tested this against a breast cancer cell line, and what did we get? Um, well. Yes, the extract was active. And at the same time, we were then interested in testing it against an in vivo model, and we used a mouse model in this particular instance. Yes, the extract is active. It actually does reduce the size of the tumors. But what was really fascinating and interesting was this result over here, where the mouse actually carried on picking up weight. So we think that this particular extract could be commercialized as an adjuvant to other chemotherapies. 
And so the Rustas always tell me all kinds of interesting and wonderful stories. And one of the stories that they said to me was that they always collect from the highest point of the mountain. And there's one particular site in Stellenbosch where they like to go to. So what we did is that we collected plants along that gradient, and then we used an LCMS-based uh, metabolomic approach to try and understand that chemical diversity. What was really interesting was that those species, those plants that were actually collected um, at higher altitudes did cluster differently from the ones that were collected at lower altitudes. So yes, maybe the rustas are actually onto something. So, we carried on with this work by looking at various different extracts, an alcoholic extract, an aqueous extract, a combination of the doxorubicin, which is a, a general chemotherapy, um, and all of those in combination, and all the different types of extracts were actually active. Just to uh, bring this back towards the sort of indigenous knowledge, the Rastafarian healers obviously don't drink any alcohol, so they would prefer to use a, a water-based uh, extract, and yes, a water-based extract actually does work. So what are we going to be doing with this particular work? We would like to ultimately be able to stabilize and standardize this extract. Uh, there is some seasonal variation that we've actually picked up, and it also gets more potent as it actually sits. So we are hoping that ultimately, once we've sorted out this particular challenge, we'll be able to commercialize um, the extract together with the bush doctors as the main benefactors. So I'd like to move on to another species, and now I'm going to change gears because I'm going to talk about a legume known as Sardinella frutescens, which happens to be called kankerbos in Afrikaans, or cancer bush in English. Yes, it has a reputation to be used by the koi and the sand for many, many generations as an anti-cancer treatment. It also has anti-diabetic effects. It is an immunomodulatory agent. Um, and we have been interested in this particular species because it has a fairly wide uh, distribution within South Africa. So we collect it from various different sites. The Western Cape, Cape is Mediterranean. These populations here are actually in a semi-arid area and, um, and also in sort of the mountainous areas of the Free State. So we got various different populations and we were really interested in this unique set of chemicals which are Sutherlandicides and Sutherlanders. And again, we used an LCMS-based -MS approach and what was really interesting was that the Western Cape populations actually clustered as a distinct uh, unit away from the Northern Cape um, populations. And this data, set of data are interesting because uh, Sutherlandicide is actually used as a biomarker for products that are generated for, some, for Sutherlandia. So this means that if farmers that are farming this particular chemotype take their material to producers, it might actually be regarded as being generally quality poor. We were also wanting to try and resolve what was actually happening here, and I'll share that data set with the next set of slides. So once we change gears and we actually use the Sutherland um, uh, regions for the PCAs, we are actually able to separate out that cluster of the Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, and Free State populations. And those Free State populations, they cluster on their own. And again, that Western Cape population seems to be pretty distinct, and it contains Sutherlandia side B. Okay. So we decided then to focus a little bit more on these Western Cape populations because this is kind of where we are. And we wanted to try and get better resolution with regards to those populations over there. And we used a PLSDA model, and this is just an S plot, which basically shows you that um, we could separate out the Western Cape populations, and I'll show that data just now. Um, and the chemical that's responsible for this is this one over here, which we haven't yet identified. But the Northern Cape populations, which contain the Sutherland side B and C, sit very separately from the Western Cape populations. So, two distinct clusters of those Western Cape populations, and what's really interesting here is that 
Hines Fire and Paley Beach actually sit very close to each other. It's a 10 minute drive. Um, so with this um, uh, PLSD model, we could actually show that there are still distinctions between these uh, plants that are collected from a region that actually is basically within the same area. So um, I'm interested in all of this because this chemotypic variation allows you to be able to pick interesting chemotypes which you can then place in an in vitro system and then manufacture those plants um, at large quantities. Nina mentioned this problem of, um, of um, industrialization and, and loss of biodiversity, and this is happening in South Africa as well. So for instance, some populations which we were originally working on of Sutherlandia uh, are no longer there because they came and built a new um, uh, sort of holiday resort on those sites, and so that biodiversity is lost forever. So we utilize a variety of different techniques in vitro uh, to try and understand this biodiversity as well. Okay, so I want to share with you a, a project which involves overexpression of taxamine. Taxamine is actually a signaling peptide that's been shown to regulate secondary metabolism in plants. We developed a system that would introduce this taxamine through agrobacterium transformation, generated a variety of different clones which we then um, assessed using various techniques. And what was really interesting and really surprising was the Sutherlandians and the Sutherlandia sites were no longer being produced. So what was actually happening here? So we think that metabolism is actually being shunted towards serosaponin production due to the transformation event uh, linked to um, taxamine. And just to show you what might be happening, uh, we think that that signaling peptide might be regul regulating sort of upstream um, uh, pathways leading to the production of beta amarin, which ultimately leads to soya saponin production, and actually silencing this part of the pathway. So my last uh, plant that I would like to introduce you to is one that I am really enjoying working on at this current time. And I usually bring it on right at the end when people are starting to get a little bit sleepy. <laughs> so this particular species, Skeletium tutosum, um, is known as Kohut or Too Good. And there's a very strong history of it being used for spiritual purposes by the Koi and the San. Um, it is a, a, a succulent. And um, I was once at a party where they were telling, uh, the one guy was saying that he doesn't drink alcohol, he doesn't do any drugs, but he just does skeletium, and it makes him feel extremely happy. So it contains a set of alkaloids that give you the sense of euphoria, and it has been commercialized as a neuropsychiatric and neuropsychological treatment. So we are obviously interested in, in this particular species because it is one of the key commercial medicinal plants of South Africa, and it's still very significant as a, a driver of the bioeconomy. There's actually a benefit sharing um, agreement between a community of sand bushmen and producers of, uh, of products that actually produce um, different kinds of things from this particular species. We isolated um, or generated different cell cultures and these cell cultures are uh, organized as well as disorganized, and both the organized and the disorganized cell masses actually produce uh, the mesomerine alkaloids, even though this callus culture produces these alkaloids at lower levels. We think that we could utilize the system and try and induce it um, to generate actually much higher levels of mesomerines. What's interesting is that this phenotype here, which we've called the compact phenotype, is a high producer of mesomerine, uh, particularly. And the mesomerine production is really related to where the mother stock actually came from. So those studies that are linked to assessing wild populations also have uh, great impact in terms of um, what actually happens in vitro. So we're really interested in actually uh, expanding on this particular project together with Yang. 
uh, and ultimately uh, do a variety of different treatments in, in different environments, uh, particularly focusing on light, which is also uh, upregulating the production of beta lanes. And hopefully, if we have all of this information, we'll have a better understanding of the metabolic regulation of mesembrine alkaloid production in skeletium. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that brings me to the end of my time. I hope with these few examples, I've been able to convince you that South African plants are interesting and exciting, and that the people of South Africa hold a very ancient knowledge, which is of great value in discovering new chemical entities. And many people to thank, and I'm not mentioning any names, but I would like to mention this group of people because these are the custodians of the knowledge that I actually uh, exploit and study in the laboratories there in Stellenbosch. Thanks to you for your time.